Okay. We're going to go ahead and get started. Hello, and welcome to NOAA's National Ocean Service Science Seminar Series. My name is Tracy Gill, and I am co-hosting this National Climate Assessment for Seminar Series with Katie Reeves, the Engagement and Communications Lead at the U.S. Global Change Research Program. I will provide some, a few seminar logistics, and then Katie will provide information on the seminar series and introduce the seminar and speakers. And so here are the logistics. If you cannot hear, see the note in the chat box as to how to fix it, or you can log off and log on, um, those are and also adjust the volume on your computer. There are two presenters today, so we allow a few questions after the first talk, as long as we can start the second talk at half past the hour to give time for the second presentation. Katie will list the relevant websites in the chat box. And if you are not on NOAA's weekly science seminar list, but you'd like to be, please email me at tracy.gill at noaa.gov, and I will add you to the list. And now Katie Reeves will introduce the seminar and the speakers. Katie, take it away. Great. Thanks, Tracy, and thank you to NOAA for hosting the fourth installment of our webinar series focused on the findings of the fourth National Climate Assessment. As Tracy said, I'm Katie Reeves, the Engagement and Communications Lead for the U.S. Global Change Research Program, or USGCRP. The Global Change Research Act of 1990 mandates that USGCRP assist the nation and the world to understand, assess, predict, and respond to human-induced and natural processes of global change. One way that we do that is through the development of a quadrennial national climate assessment. The fourth assessment was released in two volumes. The first, the Climate Science Special Report, was released in November of 2017. I just dropped the um, URL for that in the chat box. And it was covered in an earlier webinar series, which can be found on our website, www.globalchange.gov slash engage slash webinars. And I'll share that link with you um, in a moment. The second volume, Impacts, Risks, and Adaptation in the United States, is the focus of this series. As the title indicates, NCA 4 Volume 2 assesses the observed and projected impacts of climate change across the U.S., covering 17 national level topics and 10 regions. The assessment was released in November of 2018, and you can read and download it at nca2018.globalchange.gov. Today I am pleased to introduce two of our authors, Sean Carter and Prasanna Gowda, as they present on ecosystems, agriculture, and rural communities in a changing climate. Dr. Sean Carter is a senior scientist with the U.S. Geological Survey's National Climate Adaptation Science Center, headquartered in Ruston, Virginia. He has degrees from Cornell, Virginia Tech, and SUNY College of Environmental Science and Forestry, and his research interests include ecological monitoring and assessment, forest ecology, and species habitat relationships. Dr. Prasanna Gowda is a research leader of the Forage and Livestock Production Research Unit of the USDA Agricultural Research Service Grazing Lands Research Laboratory in El Reno, Oklahoma. Prasanna has degrees from Ohio State University and the University of Minnesota. His research interests include agricultural systems monitoring and modeling, irrigation management, and remote sensing. Thank you so much for joining us for today's NOAA Science Seminar. So I'll turn it over to you now, Dr. Carter. Great. Thank you, Katie. Can uh, can you hear me okay? Yes, you sound yeah, great. You sound great. Okay, thanks, Tracy. Uh, well, thank you for the invitation. Okay, great. Thanks for the invitation, and uh, it's my pleasure to uh, kind of briefly uh, give an overview of the highlights from our chapter uh, on behalf of the other uh, author team. And so I guess I'll just get started. Uh, just in terms of background and motivation, um, as uh, was mentioned, um, biodiversity is one of the um, components that's actually called out in the Global Change Research Act that needs to be addressed by the National Climate Assessment. Uh, personally, I also participated in the last NCA, NCA3, and work in a program that uh, focuses nationally on climate impacts to uh, plants and wildlife and ecosystems. So um, I was privileged to participate and uh, had a lot of capacity and capability I thought we could we could bring to the effort. Uh, and then one difference I did want to mention, uh, and it kind of speaks to the author team, is this particular assessment differs from the previous one in that we specifically try to uh, address marine systems in a, in a better, uh, more robust fashion. So. Um, so the author team partly reflects that. So um, I uh, was one of the 
coordinating lead authors uh, on the federal side with Jay Peterson. And then here is a listing of the other uh, chapter authors and chapter leads that helped out. Um, two of the chapter leads, uh, Madeline Rubenstein and Sarah Weisskopfer and my staff in Reston, uh, and were really instrumental in helping get this off the ground. I did want to also just uh, kind of underscore uh, some of the challenges related to addressing these particular issues, biodiversity, ecosystems, and ecosystem services. Uh, one difference from the previous NCA was that we now had a lot more literature, and we also had more direct observations to use in constructing the assessment, which was good. Uh, however, um, a lot of that literature wasn't consistent among systems and taxa that were being addressed. Uh, and there was also a challenge in building evidence uh, in a consistent fashion when you had confl conflicting accounts of climate impacts. Um, so the ultimate goal here is really to both highlight the most significant and emerging phenomena while also constructing and building on previous assessment results. Um, and so that really speaks to the value of trying to be consistent uh, while also being nimble and addressing some of the most uh, priority and pressing concerns. So why ecosystems? Well, I think uh, most folks would agree that ecosystems are, are a good kind of uh, integrator of a lot of these different components that we feel are significant on the natural side. This schematic just really tries to illustrate um, a little bit of the framework that we tried to use in structuring our chapter, uh, focusing on uh, direct climate change and some of those atmospheric components that were addressed in the climate uh, uh, assessment report that, that preceded the NCA uh, cha um, this chapter. Also, um, we didn't specifically address non-climate stressors uh, other than to really highlight the synergistic impacts of some of those stressors on some of these other systems. Um, those can be modulated in part through the adaptive capacity, the ability to kind of cope with climate change impacts um, at these different organization levels, as well as the adaptation strategies that are implemented. Um, and of course, the different components that we try to look at based on the existing literature uh, where species themselves and, and all components of biodiversity, um, the terrestrial and aquatic ecosystems writ large, um, ecosystem services, which uh, were added for the first time in the last NCA, and we tried to build that out again in this, in this assessment. Uh, and then speaking to the intersection with human well-being, uh, recognizing uh, the importance that we need to address both the impacts to biodiversity in and of itself and ecosystems, but also underscore the significance of the implications of goods and services that are provided to people. So just to recap on this framework, um, we really tried to structure the, the chapter to address biodiversity impacts on species and individuals and populations, uh, also on ecosystems of different kinds, terrestrial, freshwater, and marine, and then spoke to ecosystem goods and services. So we had four key messages. And again, I'm just going to briefly kind of uh, illustrate these with some examples. But there's much more detail online to those web links that Katie's providing in the chat box. Um, we examined the impacts, uh, according to these four key messages, at different scales of biological organization, ranging at the smallest level to within individuals and the genetic level, uh, up to populations, communities, um, and the ecosystems, and then broader societal uh, impacts. With regard to the impacts to species and populations, we also tried to specifically um, structure it to focus on the changes of species characteristics, changes in space, i.e. range shifts, and changes in time, specifically looking at phenology. Uh, and also recognizing that species survival, when we're talking about climate impacts, partly depends on um, the, both the, the ability to adapt the traits that they are able to uh, exhibit through genetic structure of a population, uh, and on also what changes might arise through evolution. And it's really the rate and magnitude of impacts and the abilities of these species to adapt 
their adaptive capacity. They're going to be structuring kind of the changes that we observe. Um, so in terms of this slide, um, again, focusing on the individual characteristics that allow for this um, response to take place. Uh, and then also the timing and range shifts uh, components. We have multiple examples in the literature that we highlight. Uh, and these are all governing that capacity of species to adapt. In this uh, slide, there's an example of um, leaf and bloom dates uh, at, the continent, at the North American continental scale. Um, and just in terms of reference here, when we look at the, um, the color axis, then red is going to indicate um, earlier, a trend toward earlier either leaf out or bloom date, um, and then the cooler colors are going to uh, indicate uh, later later dates. So you can see that there's a lot of geographic uh, variability in terms of the responses, and in this case, this is three different indicator plants that were being evaluated. So that that just speaks to the importance of looking at multiple species across their range and then also um, trying to tease out what those regional differences mean. Uh, with regard to impacts to ecosystems, um, again, we use ecosystems as an integrator to try and look at the in aggregate what some of these climate impacts might mean uh, at the national scale. And we also tried to specifically address some of these emerging topics and species interactions the significance of invasive species and kind of novel interactions with these communities, and then addressing primary productivity. Um, when we look at primary productivity, for example, um, there is an expectation that primary productivity is going to be uh, increasing in aggregate but uh, it, through time. But I would point out that it's really, uh, as you look into the literature, it's not a straightforward response um, when, we, when you try and figure out um, what that means in terms of other impacts related to insect outbreaks, um, impacts of different extremes, impacts of drought. So what we find is that primary productivity in particular, although it might increase and it is consistently increasing based on satellite observations in the Arctic, you don't find consistency when you look at other areas in the marine system or in the southwest, we are experiencing, expected to experience more frequent and severe droughts in the future. Climate change is also uh, expected to lead to novel and is leading to novel species interactions. Uh, and again, this is um, pretty hard to tease out when you look at some of these, um, the complexity of these interactions when you're looking across different taxonomic groups with different life history traits. There's strong consensus that trophic mismatches and asynchronies are going to occur, but the consequences uh, are few and far between when we look at the literature in terms of documenting what those direct impacts would be um, to other parts of the ecosystems and how they're going to be playing out in different parts of the country. Uh, and then this example here, uh, when we're talking about, I just tried to use the invasive species out of the chapter. Uh, and this is looking at the range expansion, projected range expansion of the invasive lionfish off the Atlantic coast. And you can see multiple time ranges here um, that, are, that are played out at, toward the end of the century. It's expected that this lionfish, uh, based on ocean warming, will ex uh, exhibit a 45% increase over its current year-round range. This is an invasive species and actually is venomous uh, and uh, is a pretty significant a predator in these systems. Our next key message focused on uh, ecosystem services at risk. And uh, ecosystem services, as I mentioned, were uh, kind of first called out. They weren't required by the Global Change Research Act, but we felt that they're really significant in this context to try and draw awareness to the impacts of climate change uh, and the intersection to biodiversity and kind of human well-being. Uh, so you can look at these different services uh, based on changes to provisioning, regulating, cultural and supporting services. And it's not uh, given that these uh, climate change will negatively impact all of these different services. Uh, for example, you can experience longer growing seasons. Uh, however, 
it's not quite so simple as having more time to grow uh, crops um, in the agricultural system, and you might hear more about this later, uh, because it requires farmers to shift practices and invest in new infrastructure, and it really takes time to adjust to these uh, potential benefits moving forward. And then also, not every community is affected equally. Some are more vulnerable than others. Uh, there's jurisdictional borders and different policy instruments that you need to take into account. So there's a lot of discontinuity in terms of the potential benefits um, or um, impacts uh, to people moving forward and how that's going to translate into the livelihoods and well-being of those uh, communities that are affected. Regardless what we're seeing based on the literature, it's fundamental change um, to agricultural and fisheries uh, production sectors, changes in uh, the provisioning of clean water um, to some of these different uh, um, changes in hydrology and precipitation, uh, changes in extreme events, and then also um, in terms of cultural ecosystem services, just a few examples. Recreational fishing is expect. We already see multiple situations where cold water recreational fishing is being impacted, uh, and these can be translated into real dollar losses. Uh, in the case of um, in in some fisheries in the U.S., experiencing at the high end end of century range of uh, over two almost two billion dollars per year in terms of lost revenue. Uh, also, there's uh, recreational opportunities that are potentially lost. Downhill and cross-country ski seasons being shifted or shortened uh, are also expected under some of the higher-end um, projections. This uh, figure that we show here um, is just looking at the projected change in the yield of corn and wheat and soybeans and cotton um, from 2080 to 2099, so again, a projection. Uh, and it's, represent, it's looking at, um, under the high-end scenario, uh, warmer colors are representing a negative percent change, uh, meaning a decline in yield. Cooler colors indicating uh, increases in yield. So again, more speaking to um, differences uh, in yields in agricultural systems that are, um, in this case, maybe a little bit more consistent regionally, but not uniform across the board for sure. And then our fourth key message uh, really dealt with what the what are we going to do about it uh, component and really the challenges facing natural resource management. This was another key message that came out in the last climate assessment uh, that was conducted with this chapter. And uh, I think that there's there's good news here and that we've seen a lot of progress in terms of the incorporation of uh, climate adaptation strategies and kind of flexible frameworks that are integrating some of these climate stressors uh, at the appropriate scale so that managers are able to think proactively about how to address climate impacts for their particular resources of interest. Um, there's still some significant challenges, however, that remain in terms of um, addressing some of the barriers to implementation. Um, we're not seeing that climate change is being comprehensively addressed in resource management at local and national scales. Uh, there's also a real need for, I think, better predictive models, um, as always, and, and just in general, um, when we talk about resource management. But we're really lack, lacking the appropriate data at the sufficient scales to try and um, give managers the information that they need um, to be proactive and anticipatory in the management that they're implementing. Um, and then finally, we, what we really need and again, I think this is coming, but it's currently lacking, is rigorous evaluation of the adaptation efforts that are being implemented so that we can really start learning from what effective strategies are out there. Uh, so again, I think room for optimism and hope here. Uh, this is really um, governed or being, it's re really requiring a cultural shift in management in some cases where managers are having to go out and manage proactively in the face of a lot of uncertainty and risk. Uh, but the cost of not doing uh, of doing nothing is so high that we really need to be engaged on the front end with resource managers to give them the information they need, explain these uncertainties so that there's an ability to move forward. And that's what we're seeing in some of these new strategies. So just quickly, uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this slide, but um, what we try to do in this chapter is speak to um, 
just a, kind of a, a wide suite of uh, impacts that we were observing at the national scale around the country. This slide is small. I would point you to figure 7.5 on the web uh, for two reasons. One is it, it's interactive, so you can actually click on the regions and find more examples. And two, I think it's just a little bit easier to navigate. But just briefly, um, what this tried to show is that we're seeing we're seeing impacts of climate change to biodiversity ecosystems all around the country. And it, um, all of these, uh, and these are observations for which we have evidence now. And whether this be in Alaska, where we're looking at Kodiak brown bears switching from eating salmon to berries that are uh, bearing fruit earlier in the year, um, looking at drying in the prairie pothole region, um, looking at reduced ice cover in Isle Royale and affecting wolf populations and requiring new management strategies for recovery there, heat waves in the northeast that are changing the availability of lobster, uh, making it um, a lot more uh, concentrated in terms of harvest and changing the fishery there. Uh, Burmese python uh, spreading in, the, in um, the southeast due to warmer winter temperatures, an example of an invasive there. Uh, the Caribbean and looking at coral bleaching uh, and the impacts of uh, outright coral death uh, and also the loss in recreational dollars from tourism can be expected to reach $140 billion by 2100. In the Pacific, the example we called out was forest birds are um, projected to lose 50% of their range uh, by 2100 by looking at as climate warms and uh, the spread of avian malaria being a significant factor for those populations. The southern Great Plains, you see uh, some of the Gulf Coast stuff in the news now, uh, but changes to the uh, sport fishery and commercial fisheries there in terms of uh, gray snapper and southern flounder uh, based on warming ocean temperatures. In the southwest, uh, wildfire is a big deal there. And we can see that um, recently uh, the, the uh, frequency of wildfire has, has doubled and is expected to even increase more in the future. And in the northwest, grape growers in Oregon and Washington uh, might actually benefit from warming temperatures as more frost-free days increase the growing season over time. Okay, I'll just quickly um, try and end on a few notes here. Um, so in conclusion, some of the things that we learned, uh, I think, is that we really need to be supportive of these sustained assessment approaches moving forward and try not to reinvent this process every four years. We really need uh, kind of a concerted effort. So I guess my bottom line lesson learned here is that we need to really be supportive of sustaining these continued assessment approaches as we learn more and targeting toward these high priority emerging topics like we try to do in this chapter. Um, and then also, uh, I think I, just from uh, um, my perspective, what we're trying to do with the National Climate Change and Adaptation Science Center, uh, we've actually done a couple spin-offs based on this work. One is we're trying to establish a framework uh, so that we can consistently incorporate new evidence of biodiversity impacts and a robust hypothesis-driven process uh, we're focusing first um, kind of where the most of the evidence now is leading us is uh, looking at range shifts. Um, so happy to talk with folks offline about uh, some of that work. And then also um, uh, Sarah Weisskopf and Madeline Rubenstein, as I mentioned before, are helping to lead a more technical review based on this information. But it's going to be, uh, it also incorporates findings from the oceans, forests, coastal systems. Uh, and tribal and indigenous communities chapter. So trying to build a, a broader community addressing these impacts and really trying to have a little bit more real estate to deal, define the technical aspects, um, which we didn't have to, we weren't able to do in this chapter. Okay, so um, I'll wrap. Uh, that's, that's it for this talk. Thank you. And uh, I guess we have time for questions. Yeah, you have. It Joel Smith has a question. Do the agricultural yield projections incorporate carbon fertilization? Um, that I am not sure. I'd have to actually dig into that specific um, document. I don't have that um, in the technical notes, so I don't know. Okay, it looks like we might have another question.
good comments, awesome presentation. If there are no more questions, we'll go ahead and move on to the second presentation. Katie, if you want to introduce our second speaker. Sure. Um, as uh, Tracy will switch over our slide deck here, um, as stated earlier, we are um, now welcoming Dr. Prasanna Gouda, um, who will speak to the um, Agriculture and Rural Communities chapter. Um, I will share a link um, for that. It was chapter 10 of our assessment. Um, and I will also just say, in the meantime, I would like to just give a plug for, for both of these chapters, really. Um, we, we are pretty proud of the Global Change, uh, or I'm sorry, of the NCA4 website. It's nca2018.globalchange.gov. And um, in addition to the figures, um, I, as uh, Sean mentioned, Chapter um, 7 has the, uh, the figure, the interactive figure 7.5. Um, and we're really pleased with how that works out. So we have some interactive figures in there. But what we also have that I want to make sure people are aware of is um, uh, we've created a lot of materials to support these chapters. And those include the assessment overview, the executive summaries, um, folders of figures that you can download um, in a zip file. And then there are even chapter-specific PowerPoint files. So if you're interested in the content that Sean shared or that Prasanna will share, you can actually download a lot of that um, in a PowerPoint file that you can then edit um, and share um, as appropriate. So those can all be accessed by visiting nca2018.globalchange.gov slash downloads. And it looks like we're all set. So Dr. Gouda, I'm going to hand it over to you. Thank you, Katie. I hope you can hear me well. OK. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, today I'm going to share some of the highlights from uh, Chapter 10, Agriculture and Rural we Communities. Can... Uh, um, we can hear you just fine. Uh, my my sure. I think I've frozen. OK. Um, first of all, I would like to uh, acknowledge my co-author, uh, Dr. Jean Steiner. Uh, she is one of our co-lead authors. Uh, Dr. Carolyn Olson, she is our uh, uh, coordinating federal lead author. Um, then Michael Grusak, Mark Boggess, and Tracy Farragon, uh, they are our uh, co-authors on the chapter. And all of us are with part of uh, U.S. Department of Agriculture. Uh, here's the outline for my presentation. Uh, first, I'm going to talk briefly about how we developed this uh, chapter. And then I'll present some statistics on the state of agriculture and rural community sectors in the United States. Then I'll present my our uh, four key messages that we developed as part of this chapter. Then we have several uh, emerging issues and research gaps that we identified as part of this uh, work, and I'll discuss that. And at the end, we'll take some questions. In uh, NCA 3, uh, the agriculture and rural committees were two different chapters. So in the NCA 4, they decided to combine them together because they are closely related to each other. Uh, that's how we end up adding uh, two chapters into one. And uh, we, in the beginning, we were not sure. But later on, uh, uh, we got a clear picture on that. In order to develop this chapter, we concentrated on the literature review from 2014 to 2018. We also have active communication with the regional and sectoral chapter authors and the stakeholders through teleconferences every month uh, with the uh, sectoral chapters. We also received uh, many, many unsolicited, uh, unsolicited uh, telephone calls and emails from non-profit organizations public. At the end, we also received input from reviewers and uh, public during the public comment period. If you look at the, some of the statistics on the agricultural sector, uh, in 2015, U.S. farms contributed about $136.7 billion to the U.S. economy, which is about 0.76% of GDP, which created about 2.4 million uh, jobs which is about uh, uh, about half of that revenue comes from livestock production. The other agricultural uh, value-added sector added about $855 billion to the U.S. economy, which is about 4.7% uh, GDP. 
and uh, created about 21 million uh, uh, jobs uh, for the for the nation. The one the good news about agriculture is uh, this is one of the few sectors that I'm enjoying uh, the, the trade surplus internationally. In 2012, when you look at the natural resources base in the nation, about 40% of the U.S. land is classified as uh, farm land. Yeah, about half of it is used for uh, livestock production. Uh, about 6% of the farm land is irrigated. Most of this land is located in the central U.S. and western U.S. These resources are affected by both uh, agricultural production practices such as uh, fertilizer application, uh, tillage practices, as well as climate change. In 2015, U.S. agriculture contributed about 9% of the greenhouse gas emissions in the nation, which seems to be relatively low number compared to other uh, sectors. But if you look at the GDP uh, from the farm income, it's about 0.78%. Uh, so it's a disproportionate uh, increase in the greenhouse gas emissions uh, when you compare that way. There are plenty of opportunities that exist to increase carbon sequestration through agriculture. That's a good news. And some of the major issues that are uh, uh, affecting agriculture today is the depletion of groundwater resources, soil erosion, and water quality. In terms of uh, rural communities, a major portion of the rural communities are agricultural dependent. Uh, here are some, some statistics. Uh, in 2012, about 391 counties are classified as rural counties. About 444 counties are kind of classified as farm dependent. In 2023, about 46 million people lived in rural uh, counties covering about 72% of the U.S. land area and accounting for about 15% of the total U.S. population. Uh, between 2010 and 2017, a major portion of the rural counties experienced uh, migration, uh, except Northern Great Plains. The, that is because of the energy boom in that region. Uh, we have about four uh, uh, key messages uh, that we developed in this chapter. I will discuss one by one in detail. The first uh, uh, key message is the climate change impacts uh, agricultural productivity. Uh, uh, in the nation, uh, based on uh, the climate change projections for the 20, uh, 2100, there's going to be increased frequency and duration of drought, and also there's going to be shifting of precipitation patterns throughout the country. And extreme temperatures during the uh, growing season is expected, especially in the southern Great Plains and western U.S. Because of these factors, uh, we're going to expect uh, food and uh, forage production declines. And for example, high temperature in association with uh, drought events uh, may increase the operation rates, which in turn affects uh, uh, plant productivity and also increases uh, fire risk. Uh, it is expected uh, 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 that uh, the fire risk are going to increase uh, uh, exponentially. Uh, particularly, tribal communities are going to be more vulnerable to increased wildfire. This is because of uh, lack of firefighting resources, insufficient uh, staff, and uh, their remote locations. And also, isolated depletion of ground and uh, surface water supplies for irrigation are expected. And uh, I have a case study that I can actually show you how it's going to happen. Uh, irrigated acreage is expected to decrease as a, as a reason for that. And you can see that very clearly in Great Plains and uh, Southwest U.S. So because of this uh, climate extremes, high temperatures, uh, there's going to be a uh, 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 decline in the uh, productivity of major commodity and uh, special uh, specialty crops. And uh, this is because uh, the high temperatures are uh, during the critical periods of reproductive development. It is going to affect the, the, the crop production. 
And uh, in the last 20 years, there is a lot of anticipation that these climate change related stresses are going to affect productivity. So there is a lot of research has been done, and that led to development of new uh, varieties of crops. And also in the last 10, 15 years, uh, there is a lot of work has been done on the climate smart agriculture. Uh, for example, uh, sensor-based irrigation scheduling where you can uh, uh, apply water when it is needed and where it is needed. In that way, the water use efficiency of agricultural production increased a lot in the last 10-15 uh, years, and there is a lot of more uh, scope to improve further. We used the Vogelal Aquifer region case study to demonstrate the climate change impact. On the left side, you can see a, a, a big uh, uh, dust storm uh, taken during 1930s over uh, uh, Stanford, uh, uh, Texas, in Texas Panhandle. This is uh, due to a, a very long, severe drought that happened in uh, 1930s. In order to uh, 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 respond to that, uh, we developed the conservation tillage and also we started irrigation. So over the last 90 years, uh, you know, the food production increased a lot. The Vogelal aquifer region is considered as a bread basket of the world. But if you look at the, the right hand uh, picture showing the, the, the groundwater depletion in the Vogelal aquifer region, in the southern portion of the, the Vogelal aquifer region, the water depleted more than 150 uh, feet of uh, saturated thickness. At the current rate uh, of uh, uh, irrigation uh, water usage there, there won't be any water left in about 30 to 50 years. So this time around, we're, uh, we're expecting the rainfall to go down uh, in, within the uh, next uh, 50 to uh, 100 years. There won't be any water left to, uh, to solve the problem. We have to come up with some other options to deal with the climate change impact. The key message too is uh, the climate change impacts uh, uh, you know, uh, degradation of soil and water resources. As you can see in the graph, uh, the graph actually on the y-axis is the percentage land area, and then the x-axis is the uh, year. The graph shows the, the number of uh, extreme events in a single day between 1910 and uh, uh, 2016. You can see very clearly that these uh, extreme events are increasing exponentially in the last 20 to 30 years. And these extreme events are going to cause degradation of soil and water resources throughout the U.S. Because the extreme events causes flooding and increased runoff, which in turn increases the soil, uh, the rainfall erosivity and sediment transport capacity, which in turn increases soil erosion from cropland. For example, coastal erosion, uh, accounts for about 500 million in damages each year, mainly due to flooding in the coastal region. And also the flooding increases uh, the increased infiltration, which in turn increases the leaching of uh, nutrients uh, from croplands to lakes and rivers, affecting the water quality. So the loss of large stocks of carbon due to uh, and nutrients due to erosion uh, uh, can lead to reduction in uh, crop productivity. And, and water quality. Uh, for example, between 1960, not 2060, there's a typo there. Between 1960 and 2008, uh, the number of hypoxic incidents has increased by a factor of 30, setting U.S. Uh, coastal economy. For example, in the, the Gulf of Mexico, uh, it is affecting a $1 billion uh, shrimp industry, and uh, the area of uh, the hypoxic IFOC, incidents are increasing rapidly. For rural population, you know, the extreme uh, uh, temperature can cause the uh, heat exhaustion, uh, heat stroke, and heart attacks. Uh, there are some evidences that uh, these uh, uh, are increasing, uh, and also this leads to uh, reduce human uh, productivity. The people in, in, in uh, at high risk in these regions include low-income groups, tribal communities, pregnant women children, and the whole people. 
the higher temperature and consequent longer growing season can also affect uh, human health through uh, uh, long uh, 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 pollen seasons. Uh, for example, in the last 100 years, uh, the growing season increased at an average by two weeks. This increases the, uh, uh, the, the, the pollen season uh, through uh, uh, ragweed and uh, uh, the increased activity by ragweed and other plants uh, uh, within the U.S. In terms of livestock, uh, here are some statistics. In 2000, heat-related losses were about 1.6 billion. Uh, out of that, 897 uh, million came from uh, dairy, 369 million from beef, and uh, 299 million from swine. Uh, the projected increase in temperatures will lead to more losses in the near future, so especially when the temperatures go behind optimal ranges uh, in livestock, it can affect uh, uh, livestock productivity through uh, affected respiration rate, heart rate, uh, blood chemistry, hormone levels, reduced intake, all these can, can, can cause uh, livestock death. Uh, in, in dairy cows, higher temperatures can cause low lactation uh, yield, that means the conversion of uh, 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 forage into uh, milk yield, there will be very low ratio, and also it affects the quality of the milk. Uh, in 2010, yeast stress alone uh, costed about uh, 1.2 billion uh, in losses. On the right hand side, there is a graph uh, showing the, the projected uh, milk uh, production decline within the next 12 years. Uh, these are arranged by the climate of regions. As you can see, the southeast and southern uh, plains are going to uh, experience uh, milk reduction more than 3.5 percent. And on average, it can vary anywhere from 0.6 to 1.35 percent throughout the country. The key message four talks about uh, vulnerability and adaptive capacity of rural communities. Uh, in um, the rural communities are highly uh, vulnerable to climate change because they are highly dependent on their natural resource base for their livelihood. This resource base is subject to many uh, multiple climate stresses. In addition to that, higher percentage of low-income communities are living in uh, uh, these rural areas. And also extreme uh, precipitation can, uh, can lead to flooding that affects uh, rural infrastructure as well as uh, uh, recreation and uh, tourism activities that would affect their livelihood. Sometimes the, there are some uh, environmental contamination due to flooding in, in, in some regions uh, that can also affect uh, uh, rural communities in, a, in an adverse way. In addition to that, uh, rural communities are less likely to have local land use regulations and building codes. Uh, lack of uh, economic activity or diversity, access to communication and relatively limited infrastructure and political crowd can reduce their uh, capacity to uh, deal with uh, uh, climate change. Once again, you know, these, these factors can uh, uh, subject rural communities to disproportionate and unequal impacts of climate change and uh, extreme climate events. So based on our literature review and discussion with uh, many of our uh, stakeholders and also the uh, chapter leads from other uh, sectors and uh, regional chapter leads, we came up with several uh, 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 issues and research gaps that need to be looked at in order to deal with uh, climate change in the near future. In the last 20 years, as I mentioned earlier, uh, public and uh, uh, private sectors uh, put a lot of resources into research, develop new varieties of crops to deal with climate change. But most of this research is focused on more a few major species like corn uh, and sorghum, but they have to be looking at other uh, uh, crops too in order to deal with climate change. In addition to that, they focus only on the yield improvement, but not on the nutritional quality, because this uh, could have economic implications. And also, uh, the additional research is needed on interactive uh, uh, effects of these climate stressors, such as uh, 
carbon concentration levels, high temperatures, and the water availability. Because there is a lot of research has been done uh, by looking at individual factors, effects on, on productivity, but, uh, but there is lot, not much research is done on the interactive effects. That is needed to under, better understand the impact fully. And also, there is a limited research has been done on the uh, understanding the climate change impacts on uh, beneficial and pest insects, pathogens, and the uh, beneficial microorganisms. Uh, uh, so there is there's, there's a lot more research needed to better understand uh, the impact of this. Uh, In terms of modeling framework, there's, there's a lot of uh, uh, work has been done with many different uh, uh, environmental models that looks at evaluating impact of climate change on the major crop. But on the livestock side, there, there are not many models which can be used to evaluate these climate change impacts. I think there's, there's, there needs to be more research done to develop this modeling framework. Um, the good news is uh, the agriculture has the ability to mitigate greenhouse gas emissions through best management practices, but we don't have a good handle on what practices uh, mitigate how much greenhouse gas emissions. So that needs to be more research uh, to understand that. Uh, finally, uh, we need to uh, uh, look at, uh, at the social science portion of the research to better understand uh, uh, the vulnerability of rural communities and to develop strategies uh, to, to enhance uh, uh, adaptive capacity and barriers to adoption for, uh, uh, for, for improving uh, rural communities' uh, capability to deal with climate change. I'll take questions if you have any. Hey, thanks, Prasanna. Folks online, if you have any questions, go ahead and type them into the chat. You can type them for Prasanna or for Sean. There, there was Sean. a question uh, to Sean on the carbon fertilization. Can I answer that question now? It's, uh, actually, I have a paragraph on that in our chapter. Yes, in some uh, 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 regions of the country, uh, the carbon fertilization can <laughs> increase the yield, especially uh, winter wheat. But if you look at the effect of uh, high temperature, extreme temperature on these crops, the adverse effects actually uh, are, uh, 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 are reducing the yield compared to, uh, uh, to carbon neutralization. So in some years, yes, you, you can have more yield, but not in all the years. Then you have a question from Adriana who asks, are there differences in agricultural effects by region, for example, yes. the U.S. Um, for example, uh, uh, in the uh, southern Great Plains, uh, there's going to be a de uh, uh, decrease in the rainfall, and also there's going to be increase in uh, 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 the occurrence of extreme uh, 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 temperatures. That would affect ET and demands more irrigation. Uh, if you look at the uh, 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 the north, the western portion of the uh, the country, I think that's where you can expect this carbon fertilization playing to role, uh, and the, that may increase yield to some extent. But other aspects can actually uh, uh, work in in a, in a negative way and bring down the the crop productivity. And on the uh, eastern uh, uh, U.S. side. I think the prolonging the uh, uh, the length of the growing season may increase the yield, and also the, sometimes there's a low temperatures uh, 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 can affect uh, the productivity. For example, winter wheat in Ohio uh, can subject to very low temperature in the spring, uh, that can affect uh, 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 the yield uh, there. Uh, in the southwestern U.S., there's going to be a lot more uncertainty in terms of uh, the rainfall. You get more rain there, but you may not get it at the right time, so that may affect uh, the productivity. Okay. Any other questions? There's Jeremy asks, could Dr. Gao speak to the mechanism behind the increasing incidence of hypoxia, the cause, 
Are certain places affected more than yes. others? Um, uh, one example would be, uh, see, when, when the upper Midwest goes through a, a, a drought event, when farmers apply a lot of fertilizer on their corn and soybean fields, it may not be utilized. Uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in the next year, if there is an you know, extreme event with flooding, then a the lot of these nutrients and uh, uh, the carbon getting into the, uh, uh, the Mississippi River, that can cause hypoxia in, uh, uh, in, a, in a big way uh, in, the, in the Gulf of Mexico. Any other questions? Yeah, I'll pass it over to Katie. Great. Thank you so much, um, uh, Dr. Carter and Dr. Gouda, for joining us today. We're really happy you could be here. Um, and thank you for all of the hard work that you did on the assessment. Um, it wouldn't be what it is without you. Um, to everyone on the line, I hope that you'll join us next week for our fifth seminar, which is going to focus on oceans and coastal communities in a changing climate. And that will be with Jeff Payne from NOAA and Andy Pershing with the Gulf of Maine Research Institute. And until then, um, have a great week. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank